What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy Calvin, the new trader. We are here in the building for its beginner podcast and different background, different scenery, a whole <laughs> lot of interesting things going on right now. So, you know, we got a special guest in the building. Today's guest goes by the name of Lambo Raul. Raul, what's going on, man? <laughs> Good, bro. <laughs> what's popping? Uh, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. So, this interview started late. It, it did. Um, Why did this interview start late? <sighs> I mean, to put a long story short, um, I started trading years ago and uh -huh. I, I started trading because I wanted to feed my addiction and uh, passion for cars. Okay. Right? Because, I mean, when you're talking about cars, they're not necessarily cheap. And I set a few milestones and one of them was a hypercar that I bought today, which, I mean, you saw, which is a, yes. a McLaren Senna. Mm. So it was a, a big, uh, a big kind of like checklist yeah. off of the box. So I'm, uh, it, it delayed the podcast a little bit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was definitely worth it. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's a beautiful vehicle. I'm sure Thank at you. the time this, this episode releases, you all would see it and all yeah. that good stuff. But I just want to say congratulations. Thank you, I appreciate definitely it. Definitely congratulations on that. I appreciate um, it. I saw the joy in your eye when you jumped out. Yeah. <laughs> and you got yeah. AB here. AB was hugging you like, yeah. so, you know, it shows that this is definitely something that, that it means something to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, you it, definitely it been working toward it. Yeah, yeah, yeah man. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Thank so you. I was I telling it. my guy, Kijan, who's, who's doing the production, I was like, you'll know when he pulls up because he's going to pull up in something crazy. Yeah. But we didn't know it was going to be that crazy. But yeah. the funny part is, is when you hit the corner, he was like, yeah, that's him right there. <laughs> so that's funny. Yeah. Um, how do we get to this point, man? How do we get oh to this God. point? Um, so cars everywhere in here, um, yeah. just the mindset that you have to go get whatever you want. Yeah. I love the fact that you are self-driven. Yeah. You're business-minded. You're not just locked into one way of doing things. Not at all. How did you get here? <sighs> oh my, I mean, it, it was kind of like a, a long start to be honest with you. Um, I mean, initially, like, I was just gonna go to the military. That was my initial goal. And to make, like, a, a really long story short, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, which after doing some basic research online, you actually can't join the military with Crohn's disease because it's a chronic disease that requires, like, constant attention and treatment, which, thank God, uh, over the last maybe like two years, I haven't had any flare-ups. I haven't, I mean, there'll be some points in time where, you know, I'll, I'll feel sick or like for the day, like I'm not doing nothing but sitting in bed. But other than that, I mean, I've been relatively healthy. Um, it was really bad. Uh, I had had, I believe two surgeries and then I almost had to go into surgery again to the point where they were just gonna start chopping away at intestine and whatever piece of my intestine was gonna be inflamed. So it was a really rough time when I was younger. And that's literally when this whole entire journey started for me was because I was like, okay, well, I can't go to the military. Mm -hmm. I don't want to follow my dad's footsteps and just be a dentist and go to dental school and do the whole nine yards, right? So I started to look up different ways on how to make money online and that's when I stumbled upon day trading. And ever since that first day, it's just been like an endless rabbit hole that has led me to where I'm at today. I love basically. it, man. So we interviewed Q yeah. and we asked him, cause I remember seeing a picture of a young you, yeah. 16, 17 year old you, or maybe it was younger, yeah. And you were at one of his... I think it was 18. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you were 18. I think it was 18. And you were at one of his... in person. Yeah, his in person. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, when you see somebody that young invest in themselves and show up, and then you look at what they're doing now and all the great things they're doing now, how does that make you feel? And I asked him, and he was just like, you know, certain people want it, and you know it when you see it. Yeah. And he was like, you were definitely one of the ones, despite whatever your dad was doing and how successful he was, For you sure. wanted, you always wanted to carve your own, yeah. right? Where For did sure. that come from? Like, I'm not gonna follow in my dad's footsteps. Like you said, I'm gonna carve my own. Bro, because one day my dad bought himself in Aventador S mm -hmm. and it was a white Aventador S, right? And I sat in it and I drove it around this community. I'm like, whatever it is that I do, I have to be able to afford one of these on my own. Because a lot of people like probably would have paid me as a typical like, oh, you know, his dad's rich, his dad's got money, his dad this, this, and that. But it's like, that wasn't the case. Although we were never like poor, it's not like my dad would just give me, here's like $50,000, son. Like, yeah. go do whatever you want with it. That, that wasn't the case. And a lot of times, like when it came down to me having my own passion and essentially doing what I want to do, 
it was never like, there was never a point in time because my dad always instilled to me, he's like, there's a difference between a rich man and a hardworking man. And I'm not a rich man, I'm a hardworking man. And if something happens to me one day, like everything is gone. Mm. And that instilled a lot of fear in me because obviously I have a family, you know, um, especially nowadays, my brothers, my sisters, my mom, and my dad was taking care of everybody. It's like, no, I gotta go out and do shit on my own. I can't be reliant on him. And that's kind of like what pushed me to go forward and essentially just try and make something of my own because I didn't wanna be a dentist, but I wanted to make the type of money that my dad was making. I don't know how much money he ever made or I don't even know how much money he actually does make, but I knew whatever it was, like I wanna be able to go out and afford these things on my own. And the only person that I have to rely on is myself. And that's really all I needed. And honestly, like my dad had a very inspirational story for me because like he was doing very well for himself at one point in time, he went through a divorce and lost basically everything. Like I saw him literally go back to sleeping at his mom's house wow. for uh, literally months. And I literally saw him like start from scratch again from a new clinic all the way to essentially where he is today. So that was like the only motivation that I needed to see. Literally someone in my direct family, my own father figure completely fail. Mm. and then start from zero again and build himself back up, not to the point where he was, but even further than that. So that's why I was never really scared of failure, to be honest, um, because I know a lot of people, that's like one thing, it's like, oh, what if I fail? It's like, bro, there's been so many people, there's even this one hedge fund manager I was reading on where he failed at his first three hedge funds and his fourth hedge fund is the one that actually took off and made him his entire net worth. And the same thing comes to trading, it's like, you can lose money like year after year after year, but let's say on that next year, on that third or that fourth year, you make all of the money that you lost back plus more. So I was never really afraid of failure. The only thing I was afraid of was not accomplishing my own goals and dreams and not having a passion to do what I want to do. Man, that's powerful right there. Yeah. I love the fact, I was talking to another trader, uh, my brother Kojo, I was talking to him and uh, he just spoke about how powerful having his dad and watching his dad and the influence his dad had on his life. 100%. And when I look at you and I see, you know, sometimes I'll see your dad in your post and he'll come in and yeah. um, like just hearing you talk about the influence he had in your life, just how important was that for you, bro? Because I, man. I think it was huge. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, especially if you're a male, you need some type of male figure or at least like some form of a father figure that you could look out to take the same steps that that individual is taking. Mm -hmm. You know, like you have a lot of people online nowadays like looking up to Andrew Tate. You know, there's just like certain figures in somebody's life that you're gonna look up to and you're gonna be like, I'm inspired by him. I wanna be like him or better than him. And to be honest, like if it wasn't for my dad and giving me the motivation and the inspiration that I needed in my life to go and do something with my life, I don't know if I could confidently say I would be where I'm at today. And it wasn't just because like he was my dad and he's successful. It was the lessons that he instilled in me. Like there's just so many things I could pick up on. Like that, that, that previous saying that he told me is like, I'm not a rich guy, I'm a hardworking guy. There's a big difference between being a rich guy and being a hardworking guy. You know, he's mm -hmm. not sitting on the beach just drinking mojitos all day. You know, he's going to his clinic from, he's, he'll be up to like, 4 a.m., which is crazy. Go to sleep at like 5, 6 a.m. and he'll be in his clinic at 9 a.m. and he'll be there all the way to like closing time, to like 6 p.m. and he'll do that. And in the meantime, he's doing all of that. He's working on other businesses that maybe he may be involved in or other investments. So that's like really all I needed to see for yeah. me to be able to go out and do things on my own. And, and again, seeing him like literally fail and pick himself back up and push himself even further is honestly like another example, like so many times where I would have blown a trading account and just, you know what? All right, let's go at it again. Let's see why I blew my account. Mm -hmm. Pick Literally pick myself back up and keep pushing myself forward. Like these are all different things that I picked up from him and honestly never giving up. Like a lot of people, they'll hit me up and I, either on Instagram DMs or comment on YouTube videos or I'll get a message on Discord like, you know, bro, like I'm going through such a hard time with trading. I'm thinking about quitting. What did you do when you ever felt like quitting? And like there was times where obviously it got hard and I questioned myself like, is this really for me? But there was never not one point in time where I thought about quitting whatever I was doing. I'm not somebody that's a quitter. Um, and when it comes down to like certain things and like failures and picking yourself back up, I had like this delusional mindset that was kind of like, you know what, like you failed at this very moment in time, but five years, you're gonna be chilling. Yeah. You're gonna be straight. Like there's nothing you're doing that 
isn't putting in the work that won't get you there in the next five years. Yeah. So me like literally telling myself that every single day and literally believing that I was successful before I was already even successful really allowed me to get to this point, to be honest with you. I don't really feel like if I would have had any other mindset, it would have gone as far as this because there's a lot of people and a lot of people determine success very differently. To me, this type of success is one that's very difficult for a lot of people it is. Uh, to obtain. And I feel like I'm very blessed. At the same time, you know, I've been put in front of a lot of different opportunities. I got into the market at the right point in time because I made a ton of money during COVID because me personally, my trading and my trading system, I'm a lot better of a short seller than I am a long buyer. And I mean, everything was going down. I mean, you had gold dumping, you had um, the stock market dumping during the pandemic. Um, and that's where I made a ton of money trading, a ton of money trading. That's where I even got my even six figure payoff from FTMO. Wow. So that's why I feel like timing was also an important role in that because like at that point in time, I already had like three, maybe four years of trading experience at that point. So it's like, I already had the experience. My psychology is pretty down packed. Like it's like the thing about trading psychology too, is like you can never say me personally in my beliefs, you master trading psychology. Because when you go from trading $100,000, $200,000 in capital to now trading half a million dollars in capital, your fluctuation in P&L is so drastic that your money or your relationship with money has to change for you to be able to manage that type of capital in the market successfully. Mm -hmm. So that's why I feel like it was also like important for the timing as well. Because like I said, me personally, I'll make 10 times more money in a bearish market, you know, somehow yeah. uh, compared to a bullish market. And during COVID, everything was dumping. So yeah. it was like perfect for me. I like the way you said that, like, trading is about preparation, 100%. meeting, timing, you know what I mean, and opportunity, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. all of them things together, you were grinding since you're 17, you got introduced to the skill set, right? Basically, yeah. So, I, I, uh -huh. I took I took a few courses, but I think when we took that picture of Q, I was, I think, 18. You was 18 at yeah, the time. I, was, I think I was 18. So, I'm not too sure. who's investing, who's giving you the money to buy these courses? Like, what are you doing to get this money to buy these Bro, courses? Bro, you know what's funny about Q's course, too? Um... I had a bike, right? And I i forgot how old I was. I was either 17 or 18 years old, mm -hmm. right? And I had a bike and my parents was like, as long as you're living under my household, you're not buying yourself a motorcycle. And I forgot how I even scraped up the money. I was working with my dad. I wasn't making nothing crazy, but mm -hmm. I was working for my dad and I was getting like a little salary and I bought myself a motorcycle because I'm like, you know what? Like I'm up. I got a few thousand dollars in my name. Like <laughs> I'm up. I'm buying myself a motorcycle. I don't yeah. care. What, you had a ninja? And I actually bought myself a, it was a CBR 600, a 2004. Okay. And bro, this was like 2017, like 2018. It was an old bike, mm -hmm. clapped out, but like, I loved it. Yeah. You know? And you paid for it. Yeah. And I yeah. paid for it. I paid for it. I ended up paying, I think it was like $3,500 nice. for the bike. And I, I got the title and, and it was like, all right, cool. And it was funny because I hid the bike at one of my friend's house and I'm like, bro, like, Leave it here. Don't even bring it by my house. <laughs> yeah. Just tell your parents, like, it's my bike. I don't care, but my parents cannot find out. And I remember, bro, his dumb one day. And it's, it's funny because we're still friends to this day. <laughs> his name is Manuel, right? Manuel, what's up, bro? <laughs> bro, his dumb I, I let him ride it around the community. First thing he does when he's done, brings it right and pulls it right into my mom's driveway. My mom flipped the big... And it's not like I was inexperienced with bikes. I had been riding dirt bikes and you know different things along those lines right mm -hmm. so i i was familiar with riding bikes my mom flipped the shit. she called my dad right away and at that time my parents were paying for my phone bill and my dad cut off the phone <laughs> bill and i had maybe like two three hundred dollars in my bank account and by that time i was already like trying to learn what trading was right and i was looking up different like things online and they're like you gotta sell the bike you gotta sell the bike wow right and i was like all right, like I really don't have like any other option in here. Like I can't store it anywhere. And my mom literally kicked the bike and that shit fell on the floor. <laughs> and um, I ended up putting it on, I don't remember if it was off or up or Craigslist. And I lost like 500 bucks on the bike and I sold the bike for three grand. I drove it all the way up to West Palm Beach, got the $3,000 cash, put it in my bank account. I was like, all right, cool. I bought a few courses and I think I had like $2,000 left to my name, mm. right? And I don't remember exactly how much Q's course costed at that time, but mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? Like people were talking about this Q Banks guy. Let me look into him. I had bought a few courses from like people on YouTube. Yeah. And 
I think his in person was uh, like fifteen hundred dollars or yeah. like seventeen hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and had like two grand. And I looked at it and I'm like, "All right, bro." So <laughs> the minute he launched it, I bought it with two of my other boys, and I ended up having the rest of the money that I had. I literally put into a trading account, and that's basically like how it all started for me because yeah. the course was like like six months out from mm -hmm. the day that I purchased it. And then I took the entire online course and I had taken a bunch of other courses. So I had started, already had some like prior experience, but then I started having like his experience and I started incorporating a different ideologies that he was teaching into his course, into my own trading. And then by the time the course happened, like, I mean, I wasn't, I wouldn't say like I was consistently profitable, but I, I was making a few thousand dollars, yeah. you know, here and there on a trade. I had already had a thousand dollar day. It was, it was a good experience. Yeah. It was a good experience. So I like to ask certain questions to bring out characteristics of successful traders. And <laughs> I'd be going on these rants, you know what I mean? Yeah. About what it takes to be successful at this skill set, right? And you just really hit like just the things that I've been discovering. A lot of people complain, right? About nobody wants to teach me. Or they complain about, I've been doing this for this amount of time. Or they complain about everybody want to sell me a course, right? You are a 17, 18 year old kid. You just sold a bike for three grand. Yeah. And you take that money and you go invest in your education. Yeah. And it's six months out. So it's not even like you finna like get access right no. now. But you're hungry. Yeah. You're hungry for the skills that you're so even if whatever you learn doesn't work, it's like you're hungry. Yeah. So who's ever, I got a course, I got a boot camp, I got this, I got, you just want the information. Yeah. And I feel like in this day and age with all this talk about a scam this, a scam that, people are missing the point. The point is you got to get exposure. It's not about what's a scam and what's not. It's about how can you throw yourself at information until you figure I, it out. I can confidently say that I bought in a few courses of individuals who have essentially disappeared by now and they're nowhere to be found. And a few of them got involved in like some crazy shit. And I could say like, most likely like there's a 99.9% .9 probability that those courses scam me, but I don't care. Mm, come I, on. I, I don't care because I made all of that money back plus more and it gave me the exposure and the first stepping stones that I needed. And to be honest, like the people that are scared to invest, especially in knowledge, I can confidently say like, like free information is only gonna take you so far in my personal opinion. When you go to somebody and you invest essentially in their experience is what you're doing. They're giving you what to do and what not to do in the markets. Mm -hmm. And like, sure, there's a lot of people online nowadays that maybe they don't have the most trading experience that are selling something or maybe you've never even traded live capital and are selling something and are showing fake trades. There is some form of at least knowledge and experience for them to even think about selling a product. Because I mean, to be honest, like I don't think anybody's just gonna randomly just start selling a product, uh, especially an information product on something they have no idea about because they'll be called out like that. Yep. You know, so you're gonna gain some level of knowledge and experience and it's just part of the business costs in my personal opinion, especially when it comes to like starting any type of business, you're gonna need to invest into that business to begin with, mm -hmm. you know? So I saw it as like a business cost and the people that aren't willing to invest in their own knowledge and their own education, to be honest, like, like you, you're scared of investing in knowledge and education. You wanna get to a point where you're making thousands of dollars a month, let's call it tens of thousands of dollars a month. Yep. You really think by being scared of getting scammed 500 bucks, you're gonna get anywhere. Like that is the most broke mindset that I personally ever read of. And, and, and it's honestly a lot of fear. Yep. But you know what, bro? The way I see life is somebody's gotta flip the burgers. You yeah. know? Yeah. Somebody's gotta flip the burgers. Yep. Somebody's gonna have to um, valet my car. You know, somebody's gonna have to be at the cashier at the gas station ringing me up for my $2 Red Bull, you know? Yeah. It, it's, without them in society, like society would not properly function, everybody can't be rich. Absolutely. You know, when you make money in the markets, it's because somebody else lost it. Absolutely. And vice versa. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man, I, I, listen, I love hearing the journey because it brings, like, it's not about what you're doing. It's about the intention and the consistency and the mindset behind what you're doing. Of course. So, tell me this. 
you're investing in these courses, um, and then you're trying things out. You're learning now from your experience. You're in the market yeah. and you're like, okay, okay, I won this trade. All right, I didn't hold that one long enough. You're learning from your experience yeah. now. You're in mom's pantry. Yeah. Talk about that. How do you know What's, about that? <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> come on, now. it's me. Yeah. All right. What's happening in the pantry, right? Bro, so my mom <laughs> had this little pantry with like an AC unit in her house. And okay. I'm like, I'm going full time. I don't care whatever the cost is. I'm building an office. I used to live at my mom's house in a room downstairs and like, I fit a desk and my chair and my computer, but it was like uncomfortable. Like the minute I scoop back, I'm smacking my bed, right? <laughs> so I told my mom, I'm building an office here. I don't care. Okay. Right? <laughs> I took all the shit out of there, threw my desk on there. And immediately, um, once my office was set up, I started putting patterns that I could recognize on the wall of charts and I, I think I have the picture posted on my Instagram mm -hmm. and I would just try and memorize those patterns as much as I possibly can because what I started to notice was that in the markets these patterns tend to repeat themselves okay and there's a probability for these patterns to play out in a certain direction when they actually do form so if I can capitalize on being on the side of like this trade has a higher probability because this pattern plays out four out of X amount of times, or maybe seven out of X amount of times, de depending on the pattern, that's the way I saw things in the beginning, mm -hmm. then, hey, like, you know, if I risk a hundred bucks to make $200 and I win maybe six to seven out of 10 trades, like, I'm gonna be up, you know? So that's, that's when the whole kind of mindset started to really shift for me. Yeah, what type, so how long were you in the pantry? Oh my God, man, <laughs> you know what? So I was in the pantry maybe like, Bro, to put like a rough estimate, like maybe six or seven months. Okay. And then I ended up moving to my dad's house because what was it? It was something that went up, was going on in my personal life where I feel like I needed to be around my dad more because of the mindset that I can adopt from him and needing that male figure because I didn't really see my dad too much when I was living at my mom's house. Like he would come by obviously, but I didn't get to spend time with him. Okay. Right. And the way I saw it is like, my dad's successful and I have direct access to him, right? So the more time I spend with him, the more I can pick his brain. And what re he really helped me adopt was just becoming more of a man, being disciplined, taking care of your things, like doing what you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Every single day he would get up to work because I was going to college for a little bit, but I was already trading at that time. And I decided, you know what, like I'm done. I'm not going to college. Mm. I'm going on this full time. And I would literally build my own routine. I was trading the London session at that time. So my routine was obviously a little bit different than your average person's, mm -hmm. right? But it was, that's to me was me literally copying, pasting my dad's routine onto building my own routine. Yeah, I love it. what it was. And then shortly after being at my dad's house, I was there for a few months. I ended up buying my own apartment. Then I bought my second house, my third house, fourth house. The level up happened yeah. like crazy. So when you started the pantry, you built the office, the trading room in the pantry. Yeah. Were you profitable? And what was like the biggest day you had at that point? Man, I mean, I feel like th those were like the really early beginner days. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest day that I had profitably at that point, it's, it's hard to pinpoint. It was maybe like close to a thousand dollars. Okay, nice. I really started having my big days when I moved in to my dad's house because I felt like there was no distractions. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it was just like, well, first of all, like I didn't want to deal with like his family and his other kids. So mm -hmm. I was like locked in my room like 24 seven when my dad would come home. Oh, hey, what's up, daddy? You know, how are you? Yeah. Right. So I was literally just locked in. I mean, even from the beginning, though, I was spending hours upon hours locked in that pantry. Um, but it really felt like there was no distractions at my dad's house. And I mean, when I was at my dad's house, it was a huge shift. Like you can go back on my YouTube channel and where you see literally like my bed in the background is me living at my dad's house. And I was having like $15,000 FTMO payouts, nice. you know? So that's where I saw a really big level dub. So, I mean, if, if that was the case, I don't know, probably my biggest day at that pantry was maybe like, yeah, like maybe like $2,000, $2,500. Okay, and then when you moved to dad's, the level up happened. Oh yeah, for sure. So you spoke about when you moved to dad, like you started getting like $15,000 FTMO payouts. Yeah. A lot of people credit you for kind of introducing them to prop firms. That was my idea behind it. Uh -huh. um, so the thing is like my profitability was very, very different, I feel. So what I would do essentially was I would deposit money from 
wherever, right? I would have a trading account, call it there's five grand in the trading account. Mm -hmm. I would turn that into maybe like 30,000, $35,000, withdraw like 15, mm -hmm. leave 15 in there, I'll lose 15. It's like, okay, great, 5K again. Same process, repeatedly. Like my bank account was growing, but like my trading account was very like stagnant. Like mm -hmm. I always had like roughly the same balance. And it was like me going and reflecting, I was like, bro, I would build up this account for days or for weeks and I would lose all of it in one day. But luckily by that point, I was already withdrawing from the markets. So I was building my bank account, which mm -hmm. was fantastic, right? To the point where I had six figures in my bank account. I remember when I saw my first 100K, I was like, damn. And the, con the, the cycle was still there though. So I was like, I need to just focus because there's something that's going on in this one day that I'm just blowing it. And what I noticed was just like a lot of overtrading and uh, it was just like a lot of over trading, revenge trading, and then you mix out with position, the wrong position sizing, See you're gonna blow your account. Absolutely. So I knew I had something. I knew I wasn't like stagnant. I didn't know what I was doing. I knew I was doing something because for me to just even be able to turn like $5,000 into $30,000, $40,000 within the span of a few weeks, right? And even seeing like little drawdowns here and there and surviving those drawdowns and coming back from those drawdowns, like I knew it was onto something, but then it was just like that one point where actually I was having a podcast with uh, Rake Trades and he told me it was essentially going on tilt. And mm -hmm. what he does to avoid going on tilt and essentially like blowing the entire trading account is he withdraws a lot of money out of his trading account and he keeps his balance like exactly the same. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if he turns 80 grand into like 300 grand that week, mm -hmm. he'll withdraw all of the profit and leave 80 grand in his account and restart. And that's essentially what I was doing. So I had adopted that type of risk management system because he would continue to trade. So if you have like 300 grand in your bank account that you made from trading profits, but you only have a hundred grand in your trading, in your actual trading account, what is at risk is your hundred thousand dollars because your four, your $300,000 in your trading account is not at risk because you can't openly open and close positions there. Right. But at any moment in time, even if you're not in a trade, your trading account is at risk because you can have like one wrong emotional decision where maybe you're over too confident and you're trying to make that loss back and you just, you can't control yourself and stopping yourself. You have that cushion in your bank account that you've already built up that, hey, worst case scenario, I blow this 100 grand in my trading account. I have another $300,000 in my bank account that's solely trading profits. I could pull out maybe 50, 100 and still be up a net profit. So it wasn't like a, a really smooth, like equity curve to the upside, right? And there was a lot of blown accounts involved, but it was still, a point where I was making more money than I was losing in the markets. It just yeah. wasn't like picture perfect profitability as to what everybody would think it would be. Yeah. You know, seeing like a big fat figure in your trading account, the big fat withdrawals, like that wasn't the case for me personally. And to be honest, like, I don't think a lot of people really have it in them, especially to like get to that point where, you know, you want to see seven figures in your trading accounts. Like, okay, cool. Do you even have like multiple seven figures in your bank account exactly. to be able to relate to those seven figures in your trading account? Mm -hmm. If you've never seen a hundred thousand dollars, like what do you expect when you're trying to go for four hundred thousand uh, dollar challenge? Yep. You know what I mean? And it's like you have these dreams and aspirations of trading like seven figures, but you don't even have a few hundred grand in your bank account. It's like, bro, take it by baby steps. Yep. And it, it, like the thing is to get to that level too. That's what I'm currently dealing with and fighting with right now. So I want to get to that seven figure level to start really pushing myself to the next level is it's a whole different mindset. And the way you trade has to be completely differently. Yeah, yeah. Right. So like I'm training myself now to go into 2024 to go push myself further than that. Cause like on a training account, I'll get to like high six figures. And I would draw all of it and mm -hmm. then restart back from zero, you know, and th that to me is comfortable, but to reach new levels, you have to come outside of your comfort zone. So that's what I'm heading into into, into uh, 2024 right now. What's up, traders? It's your boy Calvin, a new trader here. We're going to get right back to this interview. So many people are asking me, Calvin, are you still going to be trading with prop firms, given all of this stuff that's going on? And are you still funded? And will you get new challenge accounts? And my answer to all of those questions is absolutely yes. Now, this is my personal opinion. I truly believe that trading for prop firms is still a great way to get that capital up and you can take some of that capital and put it into your personal account and start building it from there. So personally, I just started another funded challenge with Blue Guardian. And the reason I rock with Blue Guardian and the reason I recommend Blue Guardian is for so many reasons. But number one is their ability to offer us a tool that helps us protect ourselves from violating our daily drawdown. The number one reason that traders like you and I 
fail-funded challenges is not because we don't know how to trade, not because we don't have the right strategy. It's simply because we hit our daily drawdown, which means that either we're revenge trading, either we just don't know that we're um, close to violating our challenge, but all of that stuff is fixed with this one tool that Blue Guardian has available called the Guardian Protector. You simply go into the back office, you set a dollar amount limit or percentage limit, and this Guardian Protector will stop you from breaching your account. It will disable your account for the day. That means no emotions, no nothing, and you can live to trade another day. Now, when I saw this tool, I said, you know what? This is a prop firm that is leveling the playing field so that we traders can have a good shot at actually passing the challenge to move on to the next stage and ladies and gentlemen that is the main reason why i rock with blue guardian something as simple as that is game changing for the trader that is disciplined the trader that has a strategy and the trader that is well prepared to take the challenge so if that is you if you're ready you've been practicing your strategy you got the data you've been paper trading and you are ready then listen, there's no other prop firm that I would recommend than Blue Guardian. On top of the Guardian Protector, you got 85% payout, which is one of the highest in the industry from day one when you get funded. You also have no restrictions on your trading. You can trade during news. You don't have to set a stop loss. You can hold over the weekend. So many great things with Blue Guardian. So to get 10% off your next challenge, use coupon code NEWTRADER, the number one. You'll get 10% off your next challenge. And there's a link in the description that you can click to get your funded journey started with Blue Guardian. Now let's get back to our interview. Love it. Love it. So I want to go left a little bit. You're 24? 25 now. You're 25? Yeah. When did you turn 25? I turned 25 in August. August. Happy belated birthday. Thank you. <laughs> You're married. I am married. Come on, man. You have a daughter? <laughs> Two daughters. Two daughters? Two daughters. You're getting busy. Yeah. <laughs> How long have you been married? <laughs> uh, about a year. Uh, it's about to be a year. You, you got really busy. Really yeah. fast. Okay. Yeah. I love that, though. Yeah. I love that. How many young men are you seeing with success, um, fame, you know, notoriety, money, access that are making a decision to settle down, find somebody, build a family? I know dad is a big part of that. You know, yeah. I'm just raising you the right way. Um, but talk to me about that, man. Why are you going left when so many people in your position are going right? Bro, like I said uh, before, like I mentioned, I have two daughters and I mean, I don't want to like talk about that situation too much mm -hmm. um, to the general public. Right. But uh, essentially, like, you know, I had a baby. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was um, with my wife on and off quite frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of negatives happened in the previous relationship where my first daughter was born. Then, you know, I was essentially going to be a single dad. Oh, uh, the child and then me and my wife reconnected and the fact that she told me that it didn't matter to her that she would love me as much as uh she would love my daughter was um uh, that was it for me that's beautiful you know that's uh that was it for me mm. you know that really showed me like um uh, she's the one and i need to stop yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I see it in you bro <laughs> man yeah i love that bro yeah it's just i made a a lot of mistakes in my past, immaturity, you know, making money. Um, I made a, I made a lot of mistakes, and she really helped me mature. And she's there with me by my side as I'm becoming more of a man. So I really have a lot to uh, thank her for. Especially like last year, I was down a really destructive path. Like I was just blowing literally hundreds of thousand dollars, like partying every single day. And I, I really like, I, I didn't care. Like I looked at my Amex statement. I think it was like earlier this year and it was like almost a million dollars and just like basically alcohol. And I was mm. like, like, you know what? Like I could have potentially still been on that same path if it wasn't for me reconnecting again with my wife um, and her making me realize like, like it's, it's time to man up. You know what I mean? I can't be a little boy anymore. Yeah. Bro, you are awesome, man. Let's yeah. go. So I'm a married man. Yeah. I've been married eight years. I got married when I was your age. I was 25. My wife was like 22. Yeah. Right? And I always talk on this podcast. I always ask people, hey, do you want to get married? And <laughs> yeah. so, and people say I try to make people get married. No, nah, because I just understand. The Bible says a man that finds as a wife finds as a good thing. 100%. And hearing you talk and get emotional like that about your wife, 
as a married man, bro, I honor that and I love that, bro. Thank you. I you are it. awesome, dude. I appreciate like, it. Like for real, man. Yeah. It's and like I, it's just like like regardless of all the materialism I may have, like I know at the end of the day, like if I were to God forbid lose everything that I have, I know my wife would be with me at the bus stop. That's and that's awesome. I could say that with like a lot of certainty. Man, that's beautiful. Yeah. Man, give your wife a shout out, man. She the real <laughs> champ here. Give your wife a shout out, man. I mean, it's Nicole Garcia on Instagram. <laughs> but they, she got more followers than all of us. Oh, man, behind. shout out to the man. Listen, bro, that is beautiful, man. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. So how is it being a dad, man? It's different, bro. It's um, And you're a girl dad at that. I am a girl dad. So teach me, because I may be having a girl coming. So my wife's pregnant yeah. right now. We don't know if it's a boy or a girl. But thank you. But if it's a girl... Teach me something about being a girl dad. Um, it's different, bro. It's I feel like it's a. I have I, I don't know how to describe it, bro. It's like a. It's uh, I don't know how to describe like the love. It's like a. It's like um, bro. I, I feel like she's like this little thing that I just have to protect and provide for, like no matter what. Like I feel like if I were to have a son, mm -hmm. right, the way I would interact with him would be very different and the life lessons I would teach him would be very different compared to like my daughter. Yeah. You know, like I want my daughter to, to essentially like never have to lift a finger in her life and she's gonna be good for her eternity while she's here with me, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but it's like, uh, it's the best feeling ever because like the minute I walk into my house, <laughs> right? And my daughter hears me coming, she'll look at me, these big <laughs> eyes, bro. <laughs> and immediately like we lock eye contact she just starts smiling, sticking her tongue out. Like I could, I could feel how much she loves me just look at the way like she looks at me. But like she's like such a, um, she's basically like a. My, my wife popped another me in a woman version. Wow. Right. Yeah. We have the same attitude and everything, bro. Because like, <laughs> like when I was younger, if my dad or my mom would try and give me too much love, like I'd be like, oh, yo, back off. Like what are you doing, right? <laughs> and I do the same thing with my daughter, bro. I'll be kissing her too much. She'll just let out this big. Girl, and I'm like, bro, this this little girl's me, bro. This little girl's me, bro. It's 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 That's it's the beautiful. best thing ever, bro. It's honestly like the best thing ever. That is so beautiful, man. I'm yeah. happy for you, bro. Yeah, I'm happy for you for real. Yeah, man. it's definitely forced me to mature a lot. And I, I'm I'm not gonna lie, like my wife does a lot to take care of her because normally I'm super busy mm -hmm. working. Um, so the time that I do spend with my daughter, I make sure like it's it's quality, you know. That's good, man. Yeah. Hey man, I can't wait, bro. Come on, yeah. come on, God. Give me, get your boy a girl. All right, I love that. So now, okay, you just got this amazing car. I did. It's worth what, like one point eight? One. Uh, well, I mean, it was for sale for one point four. I ended up getting it for roughly like one point two. Okay. After taxes. And you are just continuing to level up, man. Yeah, that's um, something that I forced myself to. Uh, to always do because what I find is like if I don't make certain moves or if I procrastinate things too long, I get comfortable mm. and I need to do some things to, again, feel like that uncomfortability. Like the money I put down on my down payment, now I'm short that cash. Mm. So what I'm going to do now is get back into the markets, walk back in and recuperate that down payment. Like, and it looks like it never left. But the beautiful thing about trading is whatever the monthly note is on that car, literally go dump it into a trading account. And essentially like the way I like to view my trading is like, okay, let's say this is a car. This is a McLaren Senna. I put X amount of dollars down. This is what it's gonna cost me every single month. And that's 5% of this type of capital. That's 10% of this type of capital. That's 20% of this type of capital in a trading account. Mm -hmm. What is easy and sustainable for me to do? And I always look at it from like a 10% perspective. Mm -hmm. I can make 10% like a joke, mm. it's a, a sneeze, which is a true blessing. Yep. I risk 2% on the trade, look for a two and a half hour multiple, do that two, three times, I'm at 10%. Mm. It works out fantastic. And essentially like the car pays for it for itself because of my knowledge and my experience that I have in the markets. All I have to do is make X amount, which is 10%. Typically nowadays it's less than 10%. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes there are times where I like, I'll allocate capital and this is gonna be my trading account to pay for these bills. Mm -hmm. And it's super simple. When I hit that goal, withdraw the money and there you go. You know, so like it's it's kind of like I'm living for free and driving what I want for free, which is a true blessing. But like that's the way I look at things. 
And then I have other trading accounts like, okay, well, let's build up to like X amount of capital because I need this type of capital to go and invest this or I need this amount of capital to put it back into leveled up and like different things along those lines, you know? That's beautiful. Yeah. Walk me through your routine now. So, so what's a typical day? So a typical day for me in terms of like a trading day, typically I'll wake up around 7, 7.30. I like to be up early because like I can't, I'm not the type to wake up my brain's awake in 30 minutes. That's not me. <laughs> Immediately, you know, freshen up get in one of the cars, go to my gas station. One of the cars, yeah, yeah. subtle flex right there, subtle flex, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it, it depends on the day, you know, because yeah. like today, um, one of my cars was blocking my rules and I was like, that bro, I'm, I'm taking the Ferrari to the gas station. Cause it's like, bro, they're, they're, they're such first world problems and they're true blessing to have these problems where it's like, bro, I just threw everything on. I got my wallet, I'm already downstairs. I'm not gonna walk all the way back upstairs, grab these keys to move this car, then I have to walk back, put it back. I'm just gonna go in the Ferrari. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Some good problems to have, y'all. <laughs> yeah. So typically by like 7.30, 8 o'clock, I'm out of the house. I, mm -hmm. No matter where I go, I like to physically step out of the air conditioning, get some fresh air. Typically, I go get a coffee, and the coffee that they sell at this gas station is literally like crack. Mm -hmm. So I'll drink the coffee, bro. Um, go back to my house. I'm back home probably like at maybe like 8.25 on average, you know, it only takes me like 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, 8.25 on average and in my backyard, I'll grab my golf clubs and I have like these little plastic practice balls. I'll just be practicing my swing for maybe 20, 25 minutes, do some type of like physical activity. And this is every single day. Mm. Um, and then by like 8.50, 8.45, I'm already opening up my trading journal and writing down my pre-market game plan for the day. Then by that time, I already send out, probably by like nine o'clock, I send out my Zoom link to my students where typically if it's on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, I actually go live with them and we all trade together. So if it's a Monday and Friday, I'll skip the Zoom portion. Right now, just get ready for the market open. But if it's a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'll trade with them. And I mean, depending on how long the trading day is, typically it'll go up to maybe like 12 o'clock, close it out call it a day, maybe at that point in time, I'll either go to the gym or I'll go to the driving range to continue to practice on my swing. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go to the gym. So it's, it's, it's one of the two. Sometimes I'll skip the driving range and then go to the gym or I'll do both. But typically it's, it's both in the same day. Mm -hmm. Come back home. Um, by this time, like the market should already be closed. And then at that point in time from like 5 p.m. to maybe like 8 o'clock at night or maybe even before that, right? I'm doing my post-market analysis or just reviewing on how I did on the day, closing off my journal, looking at the P&L, getting ready for tomorrow, answering questions on my Discord community, and then working on whatever I also have to work on for any other business that I may own and operate. Uh, there's a few other things that we're doing now, um, which sometimes like as I'm trading in the morning, if I'm already in a position, like a lot of trading is just simply waiting. Mm -hmm. I'll also be working on my other businesses if I'm not live with my students, if I am live with my students and typically I'm just answering a lot of questions, making sure everyone has the right type of clarity. If we're waiting for a setup or maybe if we're in a setup, I'm explaining the trade. Oh, hey, look, I'm gonna be taking this trade, uh, this specific area where I'm gonna be thinking about stop losses here. These are gonna be my potential take profits. And this is why I'm taking this trade. Like it's just very routine. That's like a typical, typical day for me. Okay, and this is every day? Every day, Monday through Friday, which to be honest, like I don't think I'm gonna be trading Fridays anymore because these last, few Fridays have just not been great for me. They've either been like a loss or like a break even. And oh my God, last week I had a break even trade on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday it was like a huge day. So I was like, oh, thank God, mm. you know? Mm. So how do you, like, I want to get into this a little bit. Are you looking for setups every day? Are you actually in setups every day? Or um, I'm looking like, for what's setups. the mindset on that? I'm looking for setups every day. Mm -hmm. um, typically like I'll have a playbook just like a football coach has a list of plays, he's gonna tell his player, yo, we're gonna run this play here, we're gonna run that play here. Mm -hmm. I'll do the same exact thing. So I'll look at the market conditions on the higher time frames and the lower time frames, interpret typically overall direction and volume. I'm also doing more research now on like order flow and different things along those lines and using like the depth of markets to incorporate into my trading. So I am doing a lot of studying right now before like I do make the jump to, okay, now let's incorporate order flow, let's incorporate depth of market, let's look at delta, you know, different things along those lines because I am trading futures, I'm not trading um, Forex anymore, I trade indices, so I'm okay. sure you're familiar with NAS100, SPX. Of course, absolutely. I'm also trading NAS100, SPX, and I'm trading ES and NQ futures mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I'm looking to incorporate all those different things because it's only gonna help me increase my edge. 
inside mm. of the markets and allow me to make more money, which before I really take that like big step in trading to look to manage seven figures, I would like to also have order flow down packed because it is only going to allow me to find these higher probability setups where I could put bigger money behind those setups. Yeah. You know? So um, that's essentially what I'm doing. I'll have my list of setups typically for different market conditions. I have my breakout setups and I have my bounce play setups. And I'll look at, I'll essentially scan SPX, NASDAQ, different time frames, and where those setups could potentially play out and at what price points they potentially could play out as well. And then once I identify that in the pre-market, all I literally do is wait for the market to form, see if those setups actually hold, see if that buying or selling pressure is relevant at those price points that I'm looking to take those positions at, mm -hmm. and then take the position, just manage my risk. Depending on the type of setup that I get, sometimes I'll take risk off the table, sometimes I'll be more risk on and put a lot bigger of a position. Um, but yeah, that's kind of uh, my typical day. And then I'll look at my pre-market, or sorry, I'll, I'll do my post-market journal mm -hmm. to see what setups I actually ended up taking or if maybe anything changed as price action gave me new data. I may have looked for a completely different, or I may have taken a completely different setup, but those are things that I have to put in my journal. Typically, I will always follow like my pre-market plan, but sometimes like price just doesn't give me my setups like that first hour, two hours of the day, and then like a whole new setup could form. And then I end mm -hmm. up taking that whole new setup. So my game plan of the day ends up changing by like my post market. And, I, and those are things that I do have to put down in my journal. Very detailed. Yeah, you have to be. It, you, you, I mean, trading is a business and like people, they just aren't detailed enough. It's like if you're not paying attention to all these details about your specific trading and the way you're going about things, how are you ever really going to grow? Like maybe you could get by like sloppy journaling and just reviewing your performance and get to a certain point, mm -hmm. but you're getting to that certain point and you're going to be limited and you're going to be capped. And again, like you have to ask yourself, like how bad do you really want this? Do you really want to be making like tens of thousands of dollars from the markets, like every single winning trade? And it's, it's, I mean, granted market conditions change and not every single day is going to be like tens of thousands of dollars. Like some days I make, like $5,000, some days I break even, some days I lose a little bit of money, some days I lose a little bit more than a little bit of money, mm -hmm. but then some days I make 50,000, some days I make 100,000, some days I make 25,000, mm -hmm. you know? But um, it's the work that I'm putting in that is allowing me to get there because I'm able to review my performance, the nitty detail as to if I even followed my trading plan in that morning, mm -hmm. you know? And that's what I focused on um, over these last, few months and I've really been able to excel my trading to the next level. So once I do implement different things like order flow, depth of market and different things along those lines, shout out to Umar, by the way, I was having the conversation with him mm -hmm. um, about this. And then I really do feel like I will take my trading to the next level, um, especially next year. And all I'm simply doing right now is I'm taking it slow. Yeah. You know, right now there's only two months in the year. Mm -hmm. I want to preserve as much of my gains as possible. So I really have killed my position sizing. Uh, for the year, especially, you know, we just had a crazy week this week. I mean, we had FOMC, we had a bunch of earnings reports, not just that, we had NFP mm -hmm. as well. Like, it's been a pretty hectic week, and now we're going to be approaching the holidays. So to me, it's like, okay, you know what, like, I'm just going to be chilling for the rest of the year, me looking to maybe risk $5,000 a trade and try and gain ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's pretty chill. That's relaxing for me. For me, like, that's, I don't even have to, I'm not even worried if I lose five grand. I'll look mm -hmm. at the charts. Oh, I just lost five grand. All right, let me go to the golf course. Finally, you know, the trade's over. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I'm only able to trade so well because my relationship with five grand is I chew. There, there goes five go. grand. Yeah. You know, versus some other people, if they see me say this and they try and implement the same thing, if they haven't dealt with that type of money before, they're not going to be able to trade logically and they're not going to be able to perform well. Mm -hmm. So you just have to find what those types of numbers are relative to you so you actually can excel and actually perform very well in the markets. Then again, you have to identify the market conditions. Like, why are you gonna be trading so heavily like when you have all of this economic data that's going on and you have the Fed talking about interest rates and we're approaching the holidays. Yeah. You know, it, but, but those are only things you're gonna gain with experience. With and, time. Yeah. and you have to realize like when to step on the gas and when to take off the gas. Mm. That's good, that's good. So you talk about this playbook. Yeah. When did you get to that mindset? Because, you know, there's a notion that one setup, one strategy, um, you know, one approach, stick with it. If it works, why change it? So when did the playbook come in for you? Like, the thing is, like, if you only get one strategy and you're only looking at, like, two or three different assets, how many times is that strategy really going to play out for you to trade? Mm 
Mm -hmm. you know, and if it's a one and done on the date, how many times is it going to play out on the week? How many times is that going to play out on the month? You know, and then the market conditions might not even be good for that strategy, you know? So that's why I have different strategies for different market conditions. So when those markets are in those conditions, I know what strategies are going to work well. And I'll tend to put a little bit more size behind the strategies that work well with these specific market conditions. Like when there's a lot of volume in the markets and we're seeing big sporadic breakouts with no pullbacks, I know I'm taking my breakout strategies. I'm putting big positions behind those breakout strategies versus if I only trade bounce plays. How often is price gonna take out a support and not give you that bounce play? It's like, oh, well, price never gave me the bounce play, but you know what, let's wait for another bounce play. Yeah. You know, so I like to have my playbook um, and I also like to get to see the statistics on my playbook as well because I know, hey, like these strategies, like maybe like a break and retest setup only win about 50% of the time. I'm not gonna put so much size behind this specific breakout or, and I'm just learning random statistics out mm -hmm. there by the way, or maybe, hey, like my breakout setups at a one to one and a half risk reward ratio, win 80% of the time. I'm putting way more size because I win way more frequently, you know? So that's why I like to have my playbook. And I probably introduced my playbook um, into my system within the last maybe two years, ever since I started trading indices, nice. is when I started to incorporate my playbook. And uh, especially now that it's the holidays, I'm taking trading a little bit more chill and I'm focusing on restructuring my entire educational platform because I've had so much success with my students through my educational platform. Like I had one college student this year made $80,000 on a funded account. And I think his net payout was like, what was it? Like, it's like maybe like 60 grand, I believe it is what it was. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if my course missing like key details that I'm doing now has been able to literally help thousands of people inside of my community get to that point where payouts 20K, it's like, it's not even crazy in the chat. It's yeah. just like a 20K payout, like congrats, but like, bro just got paid out like 50 Gs. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it's a college student. I had another um, student of mine who did that as well and he did it like back to back. If I've been able to get to that point, now with all of this new information and structure that I have now that's helped me get from this point to where I'm at now in my trading, bro, I'm restructuring my entire and making sure it's A++, like if my course was a restaurant and to get like three Michelin stars, that's my goal right now. So I've just been like focusing on that over the last few weeks as well. So like, that's why I'm kind of taking a chill of my training right now. Cause before like I have gone some DMs like, oh, hey, you know, like we're supposed to like 50K days, 100K days. It's like, why, why are you only making like, why are you only making like 27,000 in a day? It's like, bro, I'm just chilling. <laughs> You know? And it's like the people that say that have never even seen that amount of money in a day from nothing. Yes. But it's like Forex is like a video yes. game where people are like, oh, Raul, you only did 50K today? Yeah. It's like, bro, do you even have 50K in your bank yeah. account? And you like, know what I mean? And like the thing is like there's also a lot of people online who are showing fake results, like crazy numbers too. And like they, they don't know it, but I know it. And it's just like making that type of money like so consistently is difficult unless you really have like a large mm -hmm. account that could sustain that. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, before we get out of here, and like this has been great, by the way. I appreciate like, it. Like really, really great. I appreciate it. And I thank you for just your passion, the transparency, and just the, bro, the the real, bro, the real life emotion. I love it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I can feel your hunger for this skill set. You yeah. know what I mean? So thank you for that. Um, before we get out of here, yeah. If there is a trader that is like a young Raul, 18 years mm -hmm. old, um, you know you don't want to do what your parents want you to do, or you know you don't want to go to school. You know the traditional way of doing things is not for you. You're in this skill set. I have a saying, right? So before I finish the question, let me just throw this in there. I have a saying that traders are entrepreneurs. Yeah. And they want to control their narrative. Yeah. They want to see their skill set produce fruit yep. for them, right? Um, but they limit themselves to just trading because they think that that's any and everything, right? Yeah. But it's not. Yeah, <laughs> there, no, there's it's a not. world out I, here. I, I think that's, I, I think like <laughs> somebody who's only trading and has the mindset, I'm just gonna be a trader, would be very foolish because why are you not investing in a property? Yes. Why are you not investing into the stock market? Yes. Why are you not dumping money into the S&P 500 just to have like a long-term retirement portfolio? Mm -hmm. You know, like these are things that, to be honest, I don't talk about often, but these are things that I'm like constantly doing. Like 
most people don't know, like I dumped like five grand um, bi-weekly into the S&P 500 to just really? compound. Wow. You know? And that's just like having your money, making you more money. Like you don't need so much money sitting in a checking account. What is it doing? It's losing to inflation. Mm -hmm. You know, like billionaires are literally just trying to buy whatever they could buy. So you don't lose money to inflation. You know, I mean, that's a whole different problem at a whole different level at a whole different ball game. But like, <laughs> bro, like realistically, like I don't see like you don't need like tons of money inside of a checking account. And at the end of the day, like if the banks crash, there you go. You're only insured by the good faith of the FDIC. Like, what the even is that? Exactly. The good faith? Where is their office? Where is their headquarters, actually? Bro, what, what you know? <laughs> bro, that, bro, and first of all, like, even with, like, fractional banking, the way that the bank is using your money to go make more money, bro, why don't you do that yourself? Yeah. Not just with trading accounts, but with other investments. Like, you're going to just leave a ton of money sitting in a checking account, essentially, so you're making rich people even richer. Mm -hmm. It's like... But like, I, I think it's a, it, it's a nice dream, to be honest, to yep. like only trade, like that would be nice. But like, I don't think people think about like the stressfulness that would be involved with that. The and selfishness. Correct. I you mean, know, that that would be to someone's family that's I mean, depending on them. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, because like, th like trading is not easy, bro. Yeah. Like th I remember there was this one day where I ended up losing like 50 grand in the markets and my wife wanted to do something. I'm like, babe, sorry. Canceling all plans today. I'm going to the driving range. I'm not going to talk to you for a few hours. Mm. Bro, it's just like, bro, like, no matter at what point, bro, losing 50 Gs is any type of money, realistically, especially when you get up there, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. and like, imagine, I, I couldn't even imagine if trading was my only source of income. I don't know how I would have recuperated from that loss. But since I have so many different sources of income and investments and assets, bro, 50 grand, yeah, the loss sucked. I dealt with it throughout the day. I got over the next day and I'm able to come back to the markets and make that money back plus more. But I couldn't imagine like trading being my only source of income, waking up the next day and having the, like that nerve of just like, damn, but, like I got to make my money back. That sweat of like, damn, now I don't want to lose the next trade because I don't want to be in a bigger loss. Yeah. You know, like just put yourself in that position and think if that's sustainable for you the long term. And if it is, bro, I'm just going to pray for your heart by the time it's like 30, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I wouldn't be able to oh, imagine that. You kind of answered the question, but I'll just say the second part. If there's any advice and if there's any words of encouragement that you would give to that, that entrepreneur, that trader at heart, what would it be as they're trying to build their empire? So for that younger individual definitely in the beginning you want to keep your expenses as low as you possibly can mm -hmm. so when you do get to a point in trading which by the way like i wouldn't even especially if you're just starting i wouldn't even think about like profitability i would think about just finding the right i don't want to use the word mentor because i mean at the end of the day you don't really need a mentor although it will cut your learning curve um a lot if you can go the free route you can go like the mentor route whatever you do you have to make sure that the information that you're taking in is going to be valuable to you in the long term because you don't want to be taking in just garbage information that isn't going to get you anywhere mm -hmm. which is why i say like yo like there's so many people that know so much more than you just invest into them or even just like the free education they post online. So i post a, free, a lot of free education online i even post like trades from start to finish online too you know Trading is a long-term game in my opinion. And one thing that always helped me in the beginning was having a five-year mindset. Like if I keep at this every single day and I give it my all every single day for the next five years, I'm definitely going to be in a lot better position than I am today. So I'm just going to lock in and focus on just the skill set in general. And especially to like the mentor, I mean, not to the mentors, especially to the people who are just starting off, there's main key components that I want you to focus on. The first one is probabilities. Mm -hmm. The second one is having an edge in the markets, risk management, risk to reward, and most importantly is having a trading journal where you could track your statistics, mm. right? Because just like any business is gonna have business logs, and Umar literally said this perfectly in the podcast that I was watching him do, he, you're gonna be able to go back to three months ago and see what date that was and see what trade you took on that date and see why you took that trade. Mm. Without that information, like that's not even anything that you need to share to the public. That's something that's for yourself because you are the CEO, you are the employee, and you are the investor of your trading business. So you need to be able to interpret all of that data and find out why you're not at the point in your trading where you wanna be and how you could grow. 
you need to stop making those mistakes. And forever, for anybody who doesn't have a playbook, definitely get a playbook because it's going to take a lot of that ease on wondering like, where's price going to go? What should I wait for? And adopt an if and then thought process. You know, That's so like good. there's just so many things, but definitely like those key terms, like look them up. You know, it's having an if and then thought process, probabilities, money management, trading psychology. I mean, it's a huge one. Having an edge in the markets, trading journals, playbooks, like all of those different things. Like these are all things you can incorporate and don't feel overwhelmed that all these different concepts that you're trying to put together, bro, you have time, mm -hmm. especially if you're young, baby steps, learn one concept first, understand it analyze it, incorporate it onto the next. Yeah. And slowly and slowly show up to the markets every single day and really give it your all. Like if you want to become successful in this industry, like it's 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 gonna be more than it's gonna be more than hard work. It has to be your life's work. I like that. It has to be more than hard work. It has to be your life's work. hundred percent. That's it, man. hundred percent. That is it. I heard a wise man say, uh, he said, Calvin, why start anything? if you're not willing to give it 10 years. 100%. Before you see any results from 100%. it. 100%. Yeah. And most businesses don't make any money. I, I believe the statistics is like in the first five or 10 years anyways. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, just think about doctors. How long did it take for them to actually get a career in the medical field and then get out of debt for them to really start capitalizing? You know, so why are you gonna look at trading? Ha, I'm gonna be profitable in six months. Like, that's a joke. That's, that's a so joke. Good. That's so good, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Lambo Raul. Before we get out of here, when did you put the Lambo in front of the name? Like, when did you come up with that? It was funny. <laughs> Who came up with that? Bro, <laughs> I was at a New Year's party uh -huh. and my, I made a social media. The only reason I made a social media was to showcase whatever car I would have at that time. Okay. And I had a GTR and my name on Instagram was Raul GTR. And to be honest, like, I didn't really care to show people that I was trading or anything. I was posting maybe little profits, like, here and there, you know, thousand, two thousand dollars and I had a GTR and I was mainly showcasing the car because it's like I, I can appreciate the car itself. And then one of my and then I ended up getting a hurricane and then one of my boys was like, bro, like you don't even drive the GTR anymore. You don't post GTR anymore. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, damn, you're kind of right. But a lot of the people that I followed on Instagram, they had like the car that they typically drive in their name, mm -hmm. you know? So I was like, well, I mainly drive a Lambo now. I still gonna have the GTR I'm still posted, but Lamborghini being my favorite brand, and I, he he made me think, and I was like, you know what, you're right. And what was that one quote? There was one quote by Ferrari himself. I think the quote goes like, "You drive a Ferrari when you want to be somebody. You drive a Lamborghini when you are somebody." And that's why I put Lambo Raul on my name. Come on, man. Yeah, that's solid. Yeah. So will it be changing to Raul McLaren? No. no. Definitely not. Okay. Definitely I got not. you. I got you. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your boy Calvin, the new trader, Lambo Raul, man. Listen, this has been another great episode. And as I always say, we look forward to running into you at the bank one day, but you cannot meet us there. You got to beat us there. When me and Raul pull up, you should be walking out, duffel bag on your shoulder, big smile on your <laughs> face. That's our way of saying we all going to be successful. Holla at you later. God bless you. Take care. Appreciate you, bro. Yo, that was great, beautiful, bro. man. Thank you so much, podcast. bro. Man, that was awesome, bro. Yeah, that was great. That was really, really awesome, that was man. Great. <laughs>